I want to welcome you to the second in the series, our speaker series, which we're calling Cocktails and Conversation. Not the emphasis on cocktails, but that's important. Um, I'm Jeannie Milster, and I'm on the board of the club, um, and I'm the liaison to the House Committee, which is the group that's sponsoring uh, Cocktails and Conversation. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about how this came to be, this series. Um, it started in the Girlfriends of the Year. Um, uh, it was an idea that was brought to the board to have a speaker series. And it, it wasn't long before we realized that a lot of the topics of the speakers that we were having were would be of interest to men as well as women. So the Girlfriends handed off the series to the club. And so that's how it went to be. And we it Cocktails of Conversation this year. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, who's coming up in the future. In February, we have Dr. Edward Winslow, who's a cardiologist from Chicago. He's actually a personal friend of my husband and, and I. Um, he's, they're actually coming, they plan their visit. They come every year to visit us, so they plan the visit around the date of the speech. And Ted is going to be speaking about the history of medicine in the 20th century and how that impacts Medicare today. He's actually working on a book on that subject. Um, in March, we have a doctor from the area, Dr. Cindy A. Howard, is going to come and speak about the perception of beauty. And in April, on April 1st, we have uh, the daughter of Sugar Rubin, who's one of our members, Ruby Rubin, uh, sharing her experiences on her recent trip to Borneo and some work she did with the orangutans and sun bears. So that's what's coming down the back. Um, but today, I have the privilege of telling you about our speaker, Nadir Ardalan, uh, who has lived here for five years with his wife, Shana. Um, he's an architect and a senior research fellow emeritus at Harvard University. And he'll be telling us about the current research findings on what the most probable impacts and adaptations associated with projected sea root level rise will be for Kaliarpani and how that will impact Winnemere. Uh, he currently serves as an advisory board member for the Urban Resilience and Planning Research Group of the Million Dollar <coughs> Sea Rise Study Grant to Florida Universities of the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Sciences. That's a, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> he's also on the Windermere Facilities Master Planning Committee and has served on the Long Range Planning Committee. So it's my honor right now to introduce Mr. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Is that too loud? <laughs> Good afternoon, friends and neighbors. My sincere appreciation to Jeannie for the introduction, to our Windermere Club for organizing this presentation, and for your attendance of the talk. Acknowledgements are also made for the cooperation provided by the club and its management to the Homeowners Association for organizing this presentation. And I want to also say to my colleagues at the University, uh, Gulf Coast University and the University of Florida, who have shared really all of this information with me. And they have provided most of the information that will be shown. Hurricane Irma was a wake-up call for most of us in Southwest Florida. Is that true? Yes. My wife and I, we went through it with you here. Well, why? Because we were spared from the devastating fury of that hurricane. As a result, I wanted to share the latest findings on sea level rise, its potential impacts, and evaluate your interest in working together towards solutions to make our community more resilient and safe from such intense storms and floods. Therefore, the talk is entitled Sea Rise in Collier County and Resilience in Windermere. For 
Professor Wenglis at the Conservancy showed this slide. Uh, it's what would be the case of six, six feet of sea rise on Naples. And uh, that red dot is our town hall. So you can see that really the impact, particularly as it comes through the bays, is really significant. The outline of this presentation is more or less sevenfold. I'm going to give a little bit of a background of why I'm involved with this. Uh, something about sea rise research grant, the causes of sea level rise which most of you know, but it might be good to just review, and project these scenarios from now until the end of the century for sea rise levels with various different scenarios. But if we do something about sea rise, if we do nothing about sea rise. And uh, some of the risks to Collier County, and mitigations and measures and cost projections for these mitigations, which are at this time very early, because truly this is a phenomenon that we have not really designed and built for. And so places such as New York, Boston, uh, Louisiana, and others, and we ourselves, are just beginning to think about what do we do so that the quality of life that we enjoy here could carry on for a very long time given these perils. And that brings us to Windermere Resiliency Preparedness. So the background. When Shala and I moved to uh, Naples, I had been studying what would be the impact of these similar kind of sea rise, et cetera, in the Persian Gulf. I had a research grant of about a million and a half dollars sponsored by the country of Qatar, and we did eight countries and ten cities. When we moved down here, my friends at the school were already contracted to do studies of sea rise for Miami Beach by the mayor. So this was very good impetus that here we are in the southwest, if the east coast of Florida is investing time to look at these subjects, what about us? So I proposed that the same team uh, would come down and study Southwest Florida with regards to the risks, impacts of uh, these things, such as the sea level rise and others associated. I want to visit 40 different people, and some of them are here tonight. At that time, I also began with my team of two, this was Bill uh, Comfort was one of my informal partners, because I also spoke with homeowners about this topic. And at that time, they gave me Bill. They said, don't bother us. <laughs> Bill will be your liaison. That was a, who was a wonderful liaison. And we still are working on it. But what happened was that another individual from uh, who lives here uh, in uh, Windermere, that lady. Judy Herb, who was one of the directors over at that time of Naples Botanical Garden, said, uh, you all can come and we will hold a full day session here. So these 40 people uh, came, we sat around, and we presented the Harley proposal for sea rise studies uh, in Collier County. And uh, in fact, we had really uh, two of the members from the county, this uh, fine lady, Donna Fiola, <laughs> and uh, one important person, uh, Penny Taylor. She yeah. has to be the county commissioner for District 4, where we live. And she's really now very active. When I first went to see her and talked about this topic, she said, Another, frankly, I want to say to you that we have been asleep on this topic. And I'm glad that you brought it. Let's see what can happen, because we live in a very conservative society. So from this meeting, everybody supported the idea that we should really start 
to get sea rise into the consciousness of the county and our city. We made this proposal for a collaborative study of sea rise and surge. And can you hear? Yes. And uh, we were going to do this study from now until the end of the century, 2030 and 2050, to study infrastructure, land use, ecology, and recreation. That was the term the county said used, but it would really meant what would be the impact on our beaches, because that is what really draws people to this area. And the context would be the region, Collier County, Naples, Marco Island, and Everglades City. It was a two and a half year study, 217 to 219. And the modest proposal was, since the Harvard is a teaching research institution, we only needed $350,000 for this study. And if uh, that was uh, forthcoming, the school would also donate another 150000 So we'd have a half million. We would study all of the coast of Collier County, these three cities. And what's more important is since it's a study to the end of the century, that we're anticipating 350,000 plus people to migrate to Collier County between now and then. And it really, the edge of the sea, edge of the Gulf, has already been built up. And there's going to be very little that one can sort of develop new along there. You would have to go inland. So it was also a study of what would happen, particularly in that region where new urban centers would be developed. Well, these are all very good. So on one page or so, I'm gonna just quickly say current stats. The commissioners, because at that time, politically, there was no uh, stomach to carry on the study. But uh, they tabled. But they did formally acknowledge that sea level rise in Collier County is a priority item. Still to the day, the idea of mitigation, which we were going to do, has not been commissioned, and it's still pending for a request for proposal. Naples municipality, uh, the mayor, uh, wrote a formal uh, resolution to support this proposal, actively supported. Marco Island did also the same. NGOs such as the Conservancy of Southwest Florida strongly supported the proposal. Our private sectors, some of whom are here today, they said, no, they're the only way that this will ever go is if we cough up some money as a commitment. So that if the county gives something, we will give $50,000. So we opened an account at the Community Foundation, uh, and that's for the time we were late. But I want to say to you, that more or less at the end, I'll show that this little bit of initiative has now resulted in the fact that there's a $1.2 million commitment sitting at the Community Foundation for this kind of study. So it just takes a long time. Got to be patient. Uh, but lo and behold, out of the sky, uh, the two Florida universities, <laughs> knowing the county much better than I did, went and put in a grant proposal for BP money. Bingo! A million dollars fell into their lap. And so the county, thrilled that they don't have to cough up any money or politically to get involved, they said, no, here, let's do the university uh, research on sea rise, and you hold on, and we'll talk about uh, mitigations later. So they put me onto the advisory board of this, and I've been working with our team uh, with the county. That's the background. This is the team. It's really led by Peter Shang at the University of Florida in Gainesville and by Michael Severi, wonderful man who lives here in Naples. And this is the advisory board. Okay, so what causes the sea level to change and rise? Best information is that about 50% of it is due to the warming of oceans, to temperature rise, and to Greenland and Antarctic snow melt, which, by the way, is accelerating because it was 35 degrees in Greenland 
uh, recently. And also because on the earth we have glacier melt and we also have some subsistence in topography of land. You put all these together, you have sea rice. So what is the latest projection from this team that is accepted by NOAA right now? On the left <coughs> is an ACUM is the abbreviation of the study of the university work that we're doing. So on the left is global mean sea level. Important to know that water doesn't rise equally all over the world. And it happens that we in Florida have the highest level of sea rise, and it has to do really with the ocean currents and temperatures and other things. And so there's two different sea rises. One, that's the general one, which uh, IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change, works on. And then this is the important work that the universities are working on us here. So if you look at uh, the study of low, medium, or high levels of sea rise, low would be if the Paris Accord and others were fully implemented by all the countries of the world. The medium is that some of that had been implemented. And the high is probably more or less between these two where we are, because we withdrew from the International Accord, although many of the states are really working on it. And some of the cities are really working on it. But as a national effort, this has not been the case for us in America. In any case, the story would be that by 2030, with the best of everything, you would have zero level of sea rise. Medium, half a foot, and one foot. 2060, and then by the end of the century. By the way, that number of 6.6 .6 feet above current high high tide is what more or less the core of Army engineers is still working on. <coughs> so it's, a, it's a pretty interesting. Uh, even if you take very conservative people, that's what is projected. But if you come to us here regionally, the anticipation is that we will probably have a little bit less than half a foot by 2030, uh, maybe a foot or more by 2030. Now, by the way, this is 2020. I mean, so you know, before uh, our, our grandchildren, our teenagers, we're going to be waiting in a little bit of water. And if we go with the same study, by 2060, uh, nearly a foot, 1.7 feet, 3.4 feet, and 1.2, 3.7, So the worst case scenario of sea level rise is about eight feet by the end of the century. This is very controversial, but Professor Wainless, whose images I showed you, was really quite a bit of a known expert from Miami, that says, that is far too low. <laughs> and the business of the Arctic uh, melt, you know, the stuff that you all have read, you know. So on the left is presently our condition, where these are melting. They're about the size of Alaska. And by the end of the century, it's anticipated that it will be melted to that level. And why does it work? Well, it works because you have, unfamiliar as I am, so warm water comes underneath and essentially warms the underneath belly of these uh, ice sheets, which really float in water, and they're cantilevered out. And then you have these fissures because of melting ice on top. And little by little, they chunk, they break off their cow, and they move into the ocean and melt. The other aspect that we have to look at is, of course, the major history of earthquakes. Here we are in California and uh, in Florida. But the most important thing I want to bring to your attention 
What I've mentioned about sea level rise, sea level rise means so much rise over high, high tide. But it doesn't include all these other things. Oh, there's dastardly other things. First of all, there is surge, which could range between 1 and 28 feet. So when the hurricane comes, blows the stuff over, surge. The tide is rising up and down. We could get hit at high, high tide, and then high, high tide plus sea rise. And then you have wave action. This doesn't count that with hurricanes comes precipitation. So you have to add all of these to the intended or anticipated sea rise. So really you know that the coast will take the brunt of it, but then you'll have impact on land for all of us. Uh, this is what Naples, uh, you're the time of Vermont uh, look like, South Naples. And when my wife and I traveled up toward uh, Bonita Beach, you may have done the same. The area is just up Livingston toward the Indonesia, same level of inundation. Well, that was Irma, September 10th, coming. At that time, when it was here, it was a, a Category 5 hurricane. And we didn't know was it going to come directly uh, to us, to the east side, and it was projected to be essentially toward the Miami side. So, Shalom, now we stayed. <laughs> I was supposed to come on Sunday, I guess. So we stayed until Saturday, and then we saw the damn thing shifted toward us. And so we skedaddled out of here. I went to friends who had a high, new, modern apartment in Bonita uh, Beach and rode out the, the storm there. And what did it do, actually? The storm really followed a very curious path. And here you see, there's Nate. So it passed right over us. And by the time it passed over us, really, it had fortunately uh, been dampened. And it was really at a level of category two or category three. It's important because as it came up, it was already a category three. It could have hit us at a level of category three, which means, you know, 120, 130 miles per hour. You all know that essentially all the codes in which all of our houses here are built are built at category two for about 110 miles per hour. But when it came and went directly over Windermill, there's Windermill, it was already slowed down to a category two at about 110. But the airport registered 145 miles gusts. So as a result, the team made South Florida at risk for the following. Hundreds of billions of dollars worth of real estate and infrastructure at risk. Huge area of natural systems with mangroves and wildlife at risk. We really are fortunate. Miami has built over all of its mangroves. Mangroves serve as a buffer to reduce wave action. So we still have mangroves that can help us, and did help us. Flat topography. We are pancake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at the, the, road, uh, at the uh, Gulf Coast, we're about plus three to four feet above mean height. Here in Windermere, we're around 10. There are little rises uh, in Naples that take it up to about 114 or so. But they generally were a very flat, low shadow slope. Okay. We're also on a major hurricane track. You've seen that. We're also built on Swiss cheese. That means <laughs> we are built on porous limestone, overlaid by sand. And porous limestone's quality is that it is porous, so water from the sea, seeps through the porous limestone and comes up on land. So in Miami already, inland, there's little bubbling water coming up because that's the uh, kind of geology we have. This is very important. Keep this in mind when we talk about mitigations a little bit. 
Uh, there is a powerful climate denial environment here. Is that true? <laughs> Apparently, that's one of the risks. And also, I think the last one, and that really relates to us here, is we're far enough away from the coast, but we have the peril of flood. And I will spend most of my time speaking to you about that. Okay. This is, if you have eight foot impact on Naples, this is that sort of worst scenario by the end of the century. And you're really looking at water, blue, being underwater. And mainly it's through the bay. And of course, Port Royal and all these beautiful places are the first to get the brunt of this. <coughs> We're very safe, it appears. There's a mirror. When I first showed this to uh, some of the people at the club, they said, well, gee, we're going to be beach front property. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a little closer. This is when you hear a slightly uh, higher scale. And this map is very helpful to us. This map says, this is a mapping confidence. That means how much really good information on the topography of Naples and on Windermere do we really have and at what levels? So it's very early, very small scale. But even when that is there, we know that we have our lakes and they pick them all up. But look at all these areas where orange areas denote high degree of uncertainty. Please keep this in mind as we go on. Now, another aspect is, since we're in flat terrain, and we get rain, and we get things that cause some flooding, which those of you who are here for Burma, or those of you who have lived here for I ever came, uh, we were going through it. But everything drains by gravity to the Gulf. Now, that's all well and good. But actually, even now, when it drains, Still, some of it is so shallow that you need to have pumps to pump it a little bit higher and get into the Gulf. <coughs> we have a bunch of series of park, uh, pumps, uh, pretty near close to the, uh, to the Gulf. The reason I raise this to you is that when you get two feet of sea rise, water don't flow into the Gulf no more. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? You depend on your pumps to pump it in there, but the pumps are only pumping it up about a foot and a half. So even the pumps don't work. So you have to raise all these pumps to take. Now, that's <coughs> the future. Nothing of that sort exists today. So what does it mean? We are prone to flooding. Because when our drains back up, but it has no place to go, it comes onto the surface, and our lakes will probably have a certain amount of capacity, and then there will be water. Keep that in mind. So this is four foot impact sea rise. This is two foot impact sea rise. What it really means is that two foot sea rise would have no beach. Right. So this is really a concern. We're already concerned that we don't go to the beach because of algae and red tide, etc. But this one will be far worse. We keep piling new sand on our beaches, raising it a little bit, but we don't do it to the level that these things need. So we have to have a big consideration about the future. If we really love the idea of going to the beach, going to saltwater beaches, you have to probably build saltwater beaches inland. So there's a whole new wonderful you know, thing coming up. Dreams, new imaginations. But it's not much done about that. Okay. Now I've got to get some serious stuff. Uh, our former mayor, Governor Rick Scott, who was really, you know, he had passed a law that really uses the word climate change in any government correspondence. But he did pass this law <laughs> that's called the inaccurate into the peril of flood. And so that particular law says that SB 1094 requires consideration 
of future C risk. That's really important. That means that our uh, government and counties now have, have something to hang their hat on. Well, this one had another domain called flood insurance and FEMA risk. Mm. These are right out of, now I wish that I had done this out of uh, Wall Street Journal, but that's the only one I could find. <laughs> so, flood insurance premiums could rise and property values fall in the most deluged grown areas. Under a plan, the current administration tends to roll out in coming weeks, this is the current administration, changes to the way risk is calculated under the National Flood Insurance Plan. What does that mean? Well, Irma and other hurricanes and other fires had so depleted FEMA and its capacity that there are motions of to raise the aspect of how you pay out money for emergencies. FEMA today calls risk rating 2.0 dated in 2018 the possibility is that this, when it comes out and if it's accepted, is really going to raise the risk of flooding and how what has to happen more drastic than now that people would give us money for uh, these kinds of conditions. So our insurance rates will rise. Moody's, and many of you know Moody's. Moody's buys climate data firms. In fact, they bought the largest climate data and costing firm. Uh, has a very funny uh, name called 427. Following a stream of deadly hurricanes and wildfires in 2017, Moody's issued warnings to states and local governments that exposure to climate risk could affect their credit ratings. We're here in Naples AAA. And that means something for us. If AAA gets reduced lower, it means all of the people who get currently, uh, you know, some of the stuff you find out personally if I go through all this, very few of the major insurance companies cover us because we're so much at risk. So you have secondary insurance companies who do this stuff. Well, the more this stuff gets and we don't do anything about it uh, to reduce our risk, that means tertiary insurance companies may start to look at us. That means our rates go up. <clears throat> so it behooves us to do things that come to our mind to protect ourselves from this kind of uh, future risk. Now, what are the possible solutions and mitigation measures to see rise. Well, we know the old ones. You just look to the Dutch. Well, they build seawalls, they construct earthen levees in Louisiana. And I mentioned to you there's a problem. We're uh, Swiss cheese. Building uh, seawalls is sort of inane because this stuff is underneath the water. But you can do something. You can plant, you can maintain these precious mangroves. And our natural marshes and others, they all help with sea rise. And we could construct offshore coral reefs, islands to dampen the wave action. <coughs> we could raise critical infrastructure roads and pumps. Miami Beach has already raised its roads by three feet, its pumps by three feet. This is good for the roads. <coughs> what about what about what about for me? Only my road was raised, but my house is down here. <laughs> so these are these are band-aid these are band-aid measures. You've got to be proactive because that idea can't possibly hold in the future. You could build raised structures on pylons and maps. Already uh, building on the golf course uh, it requires that you go a certain height above sea level. So that's already being in. Build non-essential ground floor structures. You know, they said put garages there, things that are throwaways. So when water comes, really your main house or your main structure or, the, or a hospital, all of your uh, 
uh, air conditioning units and uh, boiler plant and everything is already raised so that they're not in danger. Revised land use regulations for low-lying areas. For how long are we going to keep paying uh, FEMA for areas that were low-lying and flood zone? So these are things that will probably in time come into legislation. We can also say, learn from the Dutch. We actually had the county invited Dutch engineers to the county meetings. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the Dutch are sort of at ease about this sort of topic. They said, what? Don't worry, just let the water in. We said, what? Yeah. Dutch devised inland lakes, garages, parks, plazas that double as enormous reservoirs when sea level tries. That means in the future, the planning of Naples is going to change because this one, this idea of let the water in, is probably one of the natural ways to respond. That might be very beautiful. We're already, you know, but we have 60 acres of lakes here in Windermere. It will become 100 acres of lakes. Now, that's the one I'm interested in. Conceive new, innovative, breakthrough options. Very little done about that because very little contracts have been let to planners, imaginative architects, others to do anything like this. So most of this stuff is new. So this is really interesting. We create a group here. It'd be wonderful if we thought about these things. <laughs> so now for the buck. Everything ends with an almighty dollar. Well, there are companies, God love them, or God damn them. Climate <laughs> 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 Resilient Analytics. What a good name. And you can find them all on site. They say the United States face all of the United States. What the people, how did they do this study? They took a module of 150 feet square on land and for the country, for the states that were prone to uh, sea rise, they said, okay, we're gonna take a standard module of how many assets there are, how many people there are, what other kind of infrastructure there are, and then they divvied it up along all the coastline. And they came up to the fact that in order to build sea walls, to protect that amount of assets, you probably will need $400 billion in cost. I can't believe it. They say over the next 20 years to defend coastal communities from inevitable sea rise. Let us say that this is exaggerated, but this number is so large and the other number is so near. Why, by the way, the, the 20? Whatever you read, you may know that there is this thing called temperature that gets beyond 2 degrees centigrade, or 3.5 Fahrenheit, by the end of 24. If things change and we cannot keep the temperature from rising there, we get tipping point. And a lot of terrible things happen. So, so 2040 is really the gauge by which most scientists and planners and NOAA and others talk about this topic. Oh, this is another good reason. Florida is by far the most heavily impacted state with seawall costs reaching nearly $76 billion. And then they go on to say, this is just 10 to 15% of the total application costs of local and state costs for the next 20 years. What does that mean, 10 to 15%? Well, first of all, they took a fictitious idea called seawalls, which already for us may not apply fully. But the other stuff is what do you do by moving infrastructure, roads, hospitals, houses, our lives? So that's why they're talking about that this number is only 10 to 15 percent of the cost. So we're going to go into showing what the numbers in detail. They say. Cost and seawall rent by state with a one year storm surge in 2040 and 2010. 
Florida, 76 billion. We need 9,200 lengths of seawall, and by the end of the century, over 110 and nearly 13,000 uh, miles. Counties facing costs greater than a billion. Collier County faces nearly four billion dollars, and our poor neighbors' cost by 2040 is estimated to be 187.7 million to build 520 miles of seawalls. Well, that was all the good news. Here we are. Look at that, the Gulf of Mexico, way over there, <clears throat> sitting high and mighty at plus 10. Lovely terrain, our beautiful lakes, and we're going to be adding new buildings to this lovely bridge. <laughs> right. We have a resiliency I studied about 10 different resiliency criteria around the world. I was talking with a gentleman from New York. I used their criteria. Since I'm a Bostonian, I used them. And then I used others as well. Generally, they all agree urban resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city or a community to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kind of catastrophic shock and chronic everyday stress they experience over days or weeks during possible multiple events. Well, those of you who've lived here know that we may get two hurricanes in a month. Those of you uh, have been involved with the fact that hurricanes move at different pace. Some move fast, some move slow, some are unpredictable. So you may have the impact of these things for a while. Or not, not 20 days of electricity out for us. I don't know what it was for most of you, but we went through. I want to say something here about us here. Thank God this place was here, this club was here. Because pretty well after a few weeks of suffering to it, we came here and slept in the locker rooms. Because it was too hot to exist anywhere. We didn't have emergency generator. Now some have emergency generator, but I find that maybe one about seven houses have it here in community. Also, the former manager of Matt, on the last day when the food was replenished, there was nothing available, he gave us food here. And it was like, you know, God, God bless him. <laughs> okay, so let's go identify most likely and project the stresses and shocks. Locally in Windermere, who do we go to? Homeowners Association and our club. Citywide, we go to the mayor. Bill Barnett has been here for a long time. He's about to be reelected, or he's running again. He's the person who understands it, the one who wrote that this Harvard study should be done back in five years ago, four years ago. So he's very much into it, very jolly man. And the county, really, commissioner is Penny Taylor, this report. She's holding a symposium about algae and sea rice somewhat soon. I would suggest it's good to go and get to know her. Access to William Muir Mall is really current resilience, preparedness, and capacity. I want to tell you how open everybody that I went to was here. Nothing was hidden, at least from me. This is really wonderful. I mean, everyone's like that. I mean, I've read records, engineering records, draining records, you know, et cetera. Of course, you're going to be crazy to put all this on free time to do this. <laughs> okay. Organizationally, resilience officer. We do not have a resiliency officer. Naples has had a resiliency officer for the last couple of years. I really think that, and I recommend it to homeowners, that because they take up care of most of our homes, et cetera. It'd be good if you don't hire a separate person, at least designate one person that has this responsibility. The answer to that was to be determined. Please, let's push that this person 
come to know this and be responsible. And then, of course, you, us, an informed membership. By the way, none of those costs that you saw, the billions and billions, are covered by any government program. And somebody said, oh, good, that means that it's all on our, it's all on us. <coughs> this is really something important. If those costs uh, in Naples and this county have to go into and be done to protect us, there's no legislation right now that takes care of us. So an uh, informed public, an informed member, it's really important to go out and say, these are the things that need to be legislated to protect us so that our wallets aren't totally empty because of these strategies. Capacity. What's the facilities that we have? What are the tools? What are the financial? What are the legal? FEMA, insurance. Well, I found that Irma dug deep into homeowners' resiliency and its reserve. It's building it back up, but it'd be nice to know. Is it enough in cases of big people? Oh, I, I do have to say this. I think on this topic, our own individual insurance, you can get you can get 10% discount on your insurance if you take a few mitigation measures. <laughs> to clarify, formulate mitigation strategy, a disaster plan. Would you know that we have actually disaster plan? Homeowners have an action-oriented plan for stakeholders and members. You can get it online, and uh, they, they we're going to make it available. That would have a couple to show to you. And what surprised me more was that actually our country club has a disaster plan. And then when I looked into it, it doesn't cover us. It covers the staff and the assets. Which I understand. Alerts. Please go on to Collier Alert or Collier 311. Or go to FEMA, ready.gov. They'll tell you everything you need to do to prepare for hurricanes. Infrastructure. It's very interesting. Our infrastructure is split more or less about three different responsible areas. Homeowners takes care of surface drainage, street lighting, roads, parking, and irrigation for our homes, not for the golf club. County takes care of sewer and portable water. And vendors then take care of all these other things. Building. The clubhouse. Ron Drapeau who wrote to us all that people are interested in that gathering point in care of disaster. And this is wonderful that there's consciousness because the clubhouse is not built to current hurricane code. <coughs> Unfortunately, we have an answer. One mitigation, at least in the new facilities, for casual dining fitness center. Yeah, those are all being made to current code. But then we have to talk about our own residency, which are mostly not built to current code. Um, I mentioned something about that. Very important. I mean, one of the most beautiful things that we like about our club is this beautiful landscape. In time, with salt intrusion that will come with rising seas, we've got to make sure that the future trees that we put here and planting are salt and wind resistant. Community health. This is a very important area. But the minute you raise it, everyone says, I ain't going to take care of that. Because food safety, extreme heat precipitation, senior care, these are all our own responsibility, we're told. And I guess that's true. The club has no legal liability for any of this topic. But the more this becomes an issue, we're going to look for some entity to help us. So I mentioned Matt giving us food on you know, some days. But this is very interesting. 
we all felt very secure because we had privacy protection that homeowners uh, provided. And then when I said, oh, I'm going to buy security, he said, oh, they don't take care of security. Security is the county police department. Okay, I understand. But did, anybody, did you all know that? Yeah. Well, that's, is that the end of that one? No, no, I have more briefs. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm not the man here for Truman. I'm only here to prepare ourselves for eventualities. And some of them are not far fetched. We know today that potential funding areas in Windermere exists. Why? Our houses are plus 10 NGBB national units for it. Uh, this is the way that FEMA measures. Roads are 8 to 10, 9 to 8. There are about 60 air cubes of retention basin. I think by county regulations, we only need about six, 37 acres. So that means that when it rains and we drain to the lake, this is good. But you don't drain everything to the lake. That's where you get these ponding areas. These are from engineering studies. I owe my debt to Blair Foley. He's the engineer from our community who volunteered to do the study for free for us for our community. So when I showed this to one member who lives here, he says, yes, 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 I remember. I had three feet of water ponding here. And maybe those of you who live near these circles, maybe you had similar experience. Did you, some of you recognize that some of these areas, you actually experience water accumulating? <coughs> Any show of hands? Or is this completely new? Yes, yeah. Okay, so it's not fictitious. And why is that? Because of nearly something in the order of 40 some drains that we have. 20 of them drain into the lakes. These 10 or so drain onto the golf course. So of course, so the golf course doesn't absorb that water as fast as if you can dump it into a container like a lake. And we have five drains, we don't know where they drain to. <laughs> oh, anyway, this is not an expose. This is from homeowners who showed me all the records. It's good. This is that we know who we are, what our problems might be. So let's work on these things. But my sense is that there are there, oh, by the way, big one. Who, uh, who, who here lives on uh, Windermere Way toward the North Wall? Where's Where's Hoffman? Is he here? In 2013, FEMA maps show that these areas flooded. Why are they flood from this damn channel, which doesn't belong to us? And when I ask, who owns this channel? Somebody says it's the county. Somebody says it's Mirabel. Somebody says, don't, it's not our problem. No, it is our problem. Because if this thing floods, it floods their home. So we better look into this. Mark. What about some solutions to them? Do you have any solutions? Uh, increase pervious areas around 10 potential ponding. Make those areas so they absorb water faster. Continue catch basins and upgrades. So some of these catch basins actually have rocks and stuff. They're, they're continuing, but get them to be faster. This is the one that I really think would be important, but it involves money. Consider upgrading all drains to lakes. Why is it that those 10 people, the circles, you know, don't have the benefit of all the others? So it would be nice to get a cost estimate. What does that cost? We're building new buildings. Okay, but it'd be very nice to see these things that affect our regular homes. Dredge all silted lakes and cleanouts. 
This is, I think, the club response. I think that the club has the license from the county for the lakes. Consider increase allowable discharge. I think it's going to be up. We have this point here. Let's, maybe I can point it out. Uh, Route 75. We have a point where water accumulates and then it's pumped underneath 75. That's an area that we would like to have allowed to discharge more into the county canal. It's possible. Also, under extreme conditions of hurricanes, it'd be great if the lakes are lowered to their lowest possible level so that that's the area in which water accumulates and not in our homes. Reduce impervious areas to walk into the sidewalks. We're building new facilities. They'll have parkings and roads. Make those roads pervious so water seeps through it and doesn't accumulate and add to more uh, flooding. Investigate Marbella Lake Canal Risk. It's a risk. It's a real risk. Consider Windermere Light October. You remember that yellow plan at the very early I showed that was uh, confidence level was low? It's because we don't know in detail. We do not have a topo survey of Windermere. So we don't know where is a low point, where is a high point. This is something to invest in. Because that's how you design is by what you know about your elevation. Oh, by the way, disclaimer. This is not there sharing with you what I found. Okay? Please don't tomorrow uh, sue not there because you can catch item one, three, or four. This is the last. <laughs> You'll be happy. <laughs> that conservancy of Southwest Florida is a godsend. I don't know how many of you belong or go. I don't know, so you know. They did a survey in 2018, and according to the 2018 survey findings conducted by the Conservancy, Hurricane Irma, along with recent red tide and toxic algae outbreaks, has the majority of Southwest Floridians deeply concerned about the changing climate. Some highlights from the survey. 93% agree that local, state, and federal government should do more to protect the mangroves. Those mangroves protect us. 78% agree that rising sea levels threaten the well-being of our community. 63% say hurricane or motivated them to do more to prepare for the changing climate. This is just our kind of people. You, you people who said you were already members. We made these responses. So these more or less represent us. Southwest Florida Regional Climate Change Compact with County. This is something that's really important because when these disasters occur, they occur regionally. So already on the East Coast, Miami and others have a regional compact with counties. So they could pool their money, pool their resources and engineering go out to take care of the disasters. We don't have such a thing. We just have county your counties where we live. But I think Lee County and others to form. There are already discussions about forming, but nothing has happened. Last but not least, in fact, when I presented this to some of our board members, they said this to me. And I agree. Do we need a local Naples compact of communities? If something's happening to us, huh? maybe across the street. I already had been involved with Pelican Bay, who brought a letter of support for that study. So I think that communities are around us could have a compact that we stronger than just ourselves. And I really would hope that maybe in whatever areas you all have your influence, try to get a compact of our communities to come together, put our heads together, see it might be helpful. This is the last job, I promise. <laughs> so what's next? Who will provide the solutions and actions that we need regionally and in our community? Or should we leave it to the society? Thank you.